Scripture says, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you use this time in your word for good in each of our lives. Help us to understand your ways and your thoughts better. And may you be glorified through the preaching of your word here this day, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you at last week's sermon where we preached through the church at Smyrna. It was an important sermon, and um, I did get a lot of feedback from it from people. So I encourage you to get that if you weren't able to. Could you turn on the PowerPoint there? Uh, A couple people asked that we show the PowerPoint so people could see where it's at. You can go ahead and move up to the next one, Um, Todd. Okay. You see Patmos down there out in the water? Okay, this is good, and this is nice and close. There's Patmos, where John was writing in the lower left-hand corner. Then we had the message to the church at Ephesus, which is just on the shore. And then the message further north to the church at Smyrna. And now we're 65 miles further north at the church at Pergamum or Pergamus. So that's where we're at now in regards to Pergamus. And remember... The message to the seven churches is following an old Roman itinerant traveling route. And uh, people would land at Ephesus and follow that whole thing around, the merchants would, going from city to city with their products. And um, that's how uh, John was writing to the seven churches. Okay, thank you very much. Just to give you a little information about Pergamus. It had the honor of being the provincial capital of Roman Asia. It boasted the second largest library in the world, second only to the one at Alexandria, which was monstrous. The library in Pergamos had over 200,000 volumes. There were many temples in Pergamos to various false gods and cults, including emperor worship. In A.D. 29, they built their first temple in honor of Augustus. So, that's a little background information. And in verse 12, we see Jesus coming and speaking to the church at Pergamos with a message. He says in verse 12, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Jesus has a sharp two-edged sword. The sword, brothers and sisters, is a symbol of judgment. The fact that Jesus is mentioned having the sword here speaks of two things. The sword is a symbol of authority, and it's a symbol of judgment. In regards to the sword representing his authority, we have to remember that Jesus is the ultimate authority. Matthew 28, the scripture says, Christ himself said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He is the ultimate authority. You may recall here in this book, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, Christ was called the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. He is the ultimate authority. Romans 13, 4 
says that the civil magistrate bears the sword. But the authority he has to bear it is delegated to him by God. He's not autonomous unto himself. He doesn't get to make up any law which he finds that fits his fancy. No, the authority he has to bear the sword is delegated to him by God. Therefore, he must rule according to the law of God. Amen? All civil authorities have their authority delegated to them by God. Therefore, if they make law contrary to his law, we are to obey God rather than man. So first, the fact that Jesus has the sword speaks that he is the ultimate authority. Second, it speaks to the fact that he's coming to the church at Pergamos to judge. To judge. This whole book, the book of Revelation, is about judgment. And this includes the judgment coming to these seven churches if they fail to obey Christ. Now, in verse 13, Jesus says to them, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Notice it says here in verse 13, Jesus says that Pergamos is where Satan's throne is. He says this is where Satan's throne is. And I believe the reason for that is that the church of Pergamos had um, a threefold trouble which they had to encounter as a church there in Pergamos. First, they had the cults. There were many temples to false gods, and many of these false gods had rites and practices which included sexual immorality taking place within these temples. Temple prostitutes were very common. Uh, Filthy orgies and that type of thing. Sexual practices of all kinds took place. Very sexually licentious. Um, You know, what they had then pretty much is what our nation and the world is embracing today. Once again, all of Europe has embraced this um, sexual, begin to behave as sexual outlaws. Our country is doing the same thing. We We are getting to encounter what the early church encountered before a Christian ethic and a Christian worldview Uh, came upon all of Western civilization and much of Eastern civilization. We are encountering what the early church encountered because Christianity in the last hundred years has squandered all of what Christian men before sought to establish in the land. Um, If you read about these sexual rights and the practices of the people during this time, you would be abhorred Because it's so incredibly um, worse, if you can believe that, than what we even have today. But we are moving that way at a rapid pace here in our nation. It's a horrible thing to say, to see. You know, my um, kids picked up some um, video from the library made in the 1950s by Hollywood called Sodom and Gomorrah. And... Of course, in the 1950s, they're trying to capture how would a thoroughly decadent people dress. You know, when you watch it, you're left thinking, golly, this was the best they could do in the 1950s to think this is how a wicked, decadent people, sexually licentious people would dress. It's how people dress in America today. (laughs) I mean, it's just unbelievable. I was just struck. As I watched that, thinking, this is our culture today, a Sodom and Gomorrah culture, sexually licentious. So this is what the early church was up against, number one, regards to the threefold trouble, and why I believe Jesus said it's where Satan's throne is, is there was these cults there with their sexually immoral practices. Number two is, I believe he says it's where Satan's throne is, because here, like you had in Smyrna, Here in Pergamos, you also had apostate Jews. Remember we had that in the church at Smyrna? Remember they were responsible for Polycarp being killed? How the Jews would use state worship, emperor worship, to harass the Christians, to be mistreated by the state, because they wouldn't go along with emperor worship? And remember what John referred to them, or pardon me, Christ himself called them, In Revelation 2, verse 9, 
he said that they are a synagogue of Satan. Remember that? A synagogue of Satan. Well, you had the same thing here at Pergamos, where you had apostate Jews. I believe this is another reason why he refers to the city of Pergamos as where Satan's throne is. And the third threefold trouble that the church at Pergamos encountered was state or emperor worship. State or emperor worship thrived in Pergamos, like it did in Smyrna. And um, you may recall in A.D. 29, as I said at the beginning, they had built their first temple to an emperor, namely Augustus. So it thrived there. So Pergamos was truly a place where Satan's throne was. A lot of evil to go around in the city of Pergamos. Yet the Christians there stayed true to Christ. Even in the face of such persecution as death itself, they stayed true to Christ. Antipas is mentioned specifically here by the Lord. He says, And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. Now, historically, we know nothing about Antipas. We don't know what exactly the details were, why he was killed. We know nothing of his life. One thing we do know about him, though, is what his name means. His name means against all. Against all. Which is fitting for a Christian out of Pergamos. Because he probably found himself being against all that that culture represented. With the cults and the apostate Jews and the emperor worship the sexual licentiousness that was abounding there. He was probably one who found himself against all pretty much of what the culture had to offer. In other words, he found himself in the position that most, that any true Christian in America today would find himself in. Amen? He'd find himself constantly feeling like he's against all. Isn't that how you feel? I was talking to Gene Antonio last night on the phone. I told him, yeah, I said, our country's going down the toilet so rapidly. I said, I walk around just in utter grief, probably 50% of my time, in utter grief. Not that I don't have the joy of the Lord, not that I've, um, you know, cast off my faith or something like that, but just that it's painful to watch a nation live in rebellion to God. It's grievous to the heart to know that man was created to live, to bring glory to God, and to see him live in some abject rebellion against him is a grievous thing. To know that I'm getting old and I'll die, and what are my children left with to deal with in this nation? Nothing good. Nothing good. Suffering, persecution, affliction. That's what awaits true Christians in the days ahead in America. And that brings grief to my heart, knowing that my children will have to suffer. That we didn't leave our children a nation that abounded in righteousness is a very grievous thing. To see God's law spit upon, mocked, and ridiculed is a grievous thing. It's sad. I find myself having nothing in common with this culture. And any true Christian in this culture today would find themselves in the same boat. Nothing in common. Antipas against all. (laughs) Yes. He was truly against all. And for good cause. Because he lived in a culture which was an abject rebellion to God. And that's what we find ourselves in today. And things aren't getting better. They're getting worse. Christ commends the church at Pergamos for their faithfulness to him and to the faith. Even in the face of such filth and persecution, they remain faithful to the Lord. But then in verses 14 and 15, his message to them changes. He says, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling 
block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Yes, that's hard for the American church to countenance the fact that Jesus hates anything. The peacenik, loving God only, period, that they've created, wouldn't hate anything. No, here he says he hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Again, we do not know for sure what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was, nor do we know what the doctrine of those who held this doctrine like Balaam was. But verses 14 and 15 associates the two. One thing we do know for sure, whatever it was, it was a bad thing. Amen? It was a bad thing. Christ took umbrage with it. Regarding this doctrine of Balaam, you may recall Balaam was called upon by Balak to curse the children of Israel. God did not allow him to curse the children of Israel. And Balaam ended up instructing Balak how to undermine the children of Israel. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 25. Let's go back there. Refresh your memory a little bit about this story. Three times, three different places, Balak took Balaam to a different spot, hoping that God would curse the children of Israel. Balaam refused to do it. And so he got up and he left, it says. And verse uh, chapter 25 of Numbers says, Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove. They lingered there amongst the Moabites. Balak was the king of the Moabs. They lingered there. They didn't wipe out the people like they were supposed to. They invited the people, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab, the Scripture says. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord roused against Israel. You remember there was a great disease that came upon the people. 24,000 died. And it was because of Phineas, who grabbed a javelin and ran it through a Moabite woman and an Israelite man who were committing whoredom, that God's anger stopped. And nobody died after 24,000. And when you get to verse... 16, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Harass the Midianites and attack them, for they harassed you with their schemes, by which they seduced you in the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cosby. She was the Midianite woman, the daughter of a leader of Midian. Their sister was killed in the day of the plague because of Peor. Well, it doesn't come out here, but when you go up to chapter 31, verse 16 of Numbers, Chapter 31, verse 16, you see that Balaam was uh, part of this scheme by Balak to undermine the children of Israel through sexual immorality. Verse 16 of Numbers 31 says, look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam. So Balaam, who you may recall, did have an interest in getting rewarded, honored, for speaking the word of the Lord, wanting to get some goods and trinkets. Wasn't going to get him, you may recall, from Balak, because he didn't bless him and curse Israel. Rather, he cursed Balak and blessed Israel. Well, obviously, before he left, he must have given him some counsel. Look, you're not going to beat him through warfare, so why don't you try to undermine him through sexual licentiousness? By getting them to begin to worship your gods and uh, have relations with your women. Because this is what it says. Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. Talking about what we just read about there in Numbers 25. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So, When we're here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, and it says, But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, 
who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. We obviously had people who were embracing bad doctrine and were undermining the purity of the church at Pergamos. The point that we learn from this is that if Satan cannot get you to renounce the Lord through persecution, which he was unable to do to the church at Pergamos, they stayed true to him even in the face of the worst kind of persecution, death itself. If Satan cannot get you to renounce the Lord through persecution, he will try to take you off course through bad doctrine. And that's what was happening here to the Christians at Pergamos. There was bad doctrine, this doctrine of Balaam, this doctrine of the Nicolaitans, this bad doctrine. Doctrine is of huge, listen to me now, doctrine is of huge importance. Teaching is of extreme importance to our Christian life. Every part, every aspect of our Christian life is built upon and predicated upon doctrine. How we worship, how we perform outreach, what we see as the purpose of the church, what the church should be doing in the earth, is all based upon teaching, upon doctrine. Doctrine is of extreme importance to our Christian life because what we are taught will determine what we believe. And what we believe will determine what we are, what we do. Therefore, what we are taught, therefore, doctrine is of extreme importance. When you look at the Gospels, one statement that is repeated over and over again about Jesus is this, quote, and they were astonished at his doctrine. That's said about Jesus over and over and over again. When you just take your strongest concordance and look through the Gospels over and over again, and they were astonished at his doctrine. The religious leaders were astonished at his doctrine. Civil magistrates were astonished at his doctrine. The people at large were astonished at his doctrine. Doctrine is of a huge importance to the Christian faith. What we believe. Jesus said in John 7, verse 16, quote, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. And we as his people and as his church are to make his doctrine known to the inhabitants of the earth, especially those who believe in him and follow him. In Matthew chapter 28, you may recall what Christ said there. That we are to disciple all the nations. Teaching them whatsoever I have commanded you. Amen? And look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. The apostles preached, and it's says, um, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and look what they did after they were added to the Christian faith. Verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Amen? That was the first thing the apostles wanted to do, is to introduce them to the Christian faith, to the doctrine of the Christian faith. To get them grounded in the Word of God. Get them established in good doctrine. Because if that takes place, there's a life that's going to be useful for the kingdom. Bad doctrine produces non-usefulness for the kingdom. Can actually hinder and counter what God's trying to do through His kingdom. Good doctrine causes great things to happen in God's kingdom as God's people serve Him. Because of the good doctrine they've embraced. And teach his doctrine they did. Remember the testimony of the wicked regarding the Christians? Turn with me to Acts chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. Look at the testimony of the wicked regarding the early Christians. Acts chapter 5, verse 27 says, And when they had brought them, remember some of the apostles had been arrested for preaching the gospel? And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, 
saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. (laughs) The testimony of the wicked was, is that the early church filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. Teaching was extremely important. They weren't bringing people to their gatherings to have laser light shows, dancing zebras and puppets. They were teaching the people in the streets and bringing them to their gatherings to teach them doctrine. Yeah, old, boring doctrine. Oh. And you know what it produced? Great Christians. Radicals who served the Lord in the earth and turned the world upside down. It was the testimony of the wicked. Nowadays, we got Christians who want to go to be entertained at church, and whoever has the best entertainment in the nicest building is where they're going to be at. And if you doubt me, go look and see what goes on where the big churches meet. It would make you vomit. Why am I here? If I wanted to join a moose club, wouldn't have I joined the moose club? Wouldn't have I checked out the elk club, maybe became a shriner? Why do they even go? The religion produced by American Christianity is rotten. Because doctrine is a very small thing, if at all, within the Christian churches in America. But for the early church, it was massive. Doctrine was huge. It was important to teach people the Word of God. The boring, simple Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Turn there. Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 15. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, says, And he, talking about Christ himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. All of these people are involved in teaching others doctrine. And look what it goes on and says, For the equipping of the saints, that's why these gifts were put in the church, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Amen? You get taught, you do the work of the ministry. It isn't the clergy's job to do the work of the ministry. They just equip the saints so they can do the work of the ministry. All Christians are to do the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of Doctrine. You know why the American church, why Christians in the American church are, are tossed around to and fro with every wind of doctrine? Because they've never been taught good doctrine to begin with. Because doctrine plays no important role in 95% of the churches in America. Therefore, any idiot can come up and say anything, and your average idiot Christian will sit there and listen to it, embrace it, and think there's nothing wrong with it. Up in West Bend, we have a pastor there who basically took a template from the Sodomite church and preached it from his pulpit. This is a Bible-believing church that he preached to, quote-unquote Bible-believing, one of the Elmbrook satellites. Taught the people a bunch of filth. Stood on its head 2,000 years of Christian teaching regarding homosexuality. And they all sit there and believe it. No one takes him to task. He's not thrown out of the pulpit. He wasn't even tarred and feathered. No, he's still there preaching his filth from the pulpit. Why can he get away from that? Get away with that? Because doctrine doesn't matter to the American church. Let me a C spot run is homosexuality. From the Word of God. They don't care. They'll countenance him, they'll accommodate him, they'll put up with it. 
If you love God, that will bother you. You don't care if you know Him. You don't care if He's your buddy, if He smiles, if He came over to your house on Christmas. If He's standing in that pulpit teaching that kind of filth, you're going to despise what He did and you're going to take Him to task. And until He makes it right, there isn't going to be peace. You know, a lot of people think peace is the absence of conflict. That isn't God's view of peace. God's view of peace is when all come under His rule, then there will be peace. You know how the United Nations likes to talk about peace in the earth? You know what peace they're talking about? When all of us come under their rule, that's when there will be peace. Well, Christ has His kingdom, and He talks about peace. There's not going to be any peace till all come under His rule. Amen? Turn back with me, in fact, while we're on that thought, to Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. Here the children of Israel were in rebellion to God's rule. God brings a plague. 24,000 of them drop dead. That's a pretty miry situation, eh? Okay? Not all positive like American Christianity wants to be. Oh, this is a little negative. There's a little negative. 24,000 dead carcasses laying around the camp. And then one guy gets carried away, some zealot, some fanatic, someone who took his faith a little too seriously, grabs a javelin and actually runs it right through a man and a woman. This isn't a peaceful situation. But look what happens here. Now, when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman, through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This Phineas, how terrible. What a miserable fellow. Could you believe he would actually do something like that? Is that what God said to Moses about Phineas? Look what he says. Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel because he was zealous with my zeal among them so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. Peace isn't the absence of conflict. How much more conflicted can you get than a situation like this where 24,000 carcasses are laying on the ground, instantly killed, and a javelin sitting there with blood splattered everywhere right through a man and a woman? That's not the absence of conflict. That is conflict. The covenant of peace has to do with the fact that all come into conformity with His rule. Amen? That's when there will be peace. Extremely important to understand. That's when there will be peace. It's a sad situation that we have here in America today. They want peace, thinking it's the absence of conflict. They don't care when people make filthy doctrine part of their preaching from the pulpit. They don't take them to task. Why? Because doctrine doesn't mean much to the American church. Its brain has been shrunk by its entertainment, by its TV watching, by its video game playing. Its brain is little. Doctrine means nothing to it. And that's why we have a rotten Christianity in America today. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. I remind you again, teaching is of extreme importance to our Christian life. Every part, every aspect of our Christian life is built upon and predicated upon doctrine. How we worship, how we perform outreach, what we see as the purpose of the church, what the church should be doing in the earth is all based upon doctrine. Doctrine is of extreme importance to our Christian life because what we are taught will determine what we believe. 
And what we believe will determine what we are and what we do. Amen? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, the Scripture says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That sums up American Christianity today perfectly. Amen? Sums it up perfectly. If you doubt me, look who has the biggest crowds listening to them. Look who has the biggest church buildings built. The phonies. The dogs, the fakes, the charlatans. People love to hear their nonsense, their positive thinking mentality with a little theology dashed on top of it. They want wealth, so they run to teachers that tell them, God wants you rich. They are willing to allow false teachers to pervert even the most C-spot-run teachings, as I've mentioned, regarding homosexuality. I bring this up again because it's huge. For all that's being done to promote homosexuality in the earth, in our nation, is it incredible how little you read coming from Christian circles about homosexuality? I dare say like nothing! You've been to the Christian bookstore? Yeah, find that book dealing with homosexuality. You can find about 20 of them talking about you and how God wants you to be popular and wealthy and how life is all about you. Find one about homosexuality. Go on the Internet. See how little is written about it from Christian circles. Get the Christian newspaper. You see anything in there about homosexuality? Watch TVN. As stinky as that form of Christianity is. You ever see them talking about homosexuality? No, you don't, do you? In fact, what you see is the exact opposite. This last week, Rick Warren, the evangelical guru, I mean, there are, I'm a pastor, I know. There are literally thousands of pastors who hang on this man's every word. They actually get emails from him every week. They even get sermon outlines from him. Well, he was on Larry King Live this past week telling everybody that he's not anti-gay marriage. He swore up and down and said, I didn't have anything. I never supported Proposition 8, which upheld the biblical form of marriage in California, which is where he pastors. He said, I never promoted or upheld, or supported Proposition 8, he swore it off completely. He made it clear that he uh, called up some of his homosexual friends and apologized to them when Proposition 8 did pass, that people supported such a thing. Well, you can go back to October and you can see Rick Warren, a videotape of him, supporting Proposition 8. But now here he is on Larry King Live, six months later, swearing off that he ever supported Proposition 8. I could really care less about the fact that he's a liar. The thing that bothers me is the fact that he's a traitor. He's a traitor to the Lord and to his word. He fears man more than he fears God. It's just that simple. God's word is clear. This is an abomination. It's filth. It's perverted. And we as his ambassadors need to make this nation know what his law word says about it. And here he sits on national TV and carries water for the sodomites in the name of a Christian minister? It's horrible to watch. The deafening silence of the pulpits and those who actually carry water for these filthy perverts is sickening to watch. They're teaching this to children in the school system now. Homosexuality being fine. Homosexual marriage being okay. It's the new 
Civil rights cause celeb for the young generation. Yet most Christians still send their children there. Why? All has to do with money. Money and laziness. Those who don't are indifferent. Those who keep their children at home and teach them at home, they're indifferent. They don't care if all these other people are being taught. Other kids are being taught this filth. Not realizing that those children will corrupt the whole of society. 95% of children go to the government school system in America. They will corrupt the whole of society. While they continue to be taught this filth, while Christians say, well, I teach mine at home, I'm keeping my kids away from that. Listen, they're already enacting, and it's only going to get worse, public policy which makes Christianity outlawed, and Christians conform with the homosexual worldview. We have to be involved in public policy matters. Why? Because we're ambassadors to our king. And we are to make his law and his great salvation known to the peoples of the earth. Look at verse 2 of chapter 4. He says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching or doctrine. That's what the Christian's supposed to be doing. But the people he talks about here didn't want to endure sound teaching anymore. Something that's gone on and on down through Christian history. Look what Paul said to a young minister in the book of Titus. Titus was a young man. Paul was exhorting him in the book of Titus. And look at the emphasis on doctrine. Titus 1, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine Showing integrity. Verse 10 of chapter 2. Not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Amen? What was a big emphasis for Paul in regards to young men who were going into ministry? Titus was a minister. Doctrine. Look what he says to Timothy, another young minister. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Look at verse 13 of chapter 4. Till I come, give attention to reading to exhortation, to doctrine. Verse 13, or verse 16 of chapter 4. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Amen? What did he emphasize to young ministers? Doctrine. Having good doctrine and teaching others good doctrine and finding other good young men that they might teach good doctrine. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. He says to Timothy here, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Doctrine is extremely important to the Christian church. And yet there is so little of it being taught and upheld in American Christianity today. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Paul says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. 
We must obey the doctrine of God from our heart. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. Amen? When people hold or embrace doctrine which is contrary to Scripture, we are to avoid them. Yea, we are to bring church discipline. And because the church of Pergamos was allowing those who held to the doctrine of Balaam and to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans to exist among them, they were being undermined or corrupted by this false doctrine. And because they were tolerating it and not bringing church discipline upon those, they too would suffer when God brings his judgment upon them. Go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. He says, repent. He says that to the whole congregation. Why? Because they were tolerating this garbage. So they were partly responsible for it. Or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He's coming in judgment. In authority and judgment for the church at Pergamos. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And what he's saying here to them is, doctrine is important. If i got to say it again, I'll say it again ad nauseum. I hope it sticks within your head. Teaching is of extreme importance to our Christian life. You should want to read Christian books, Christian doctrine, good books. You don't know what good books are? See me. I can point you to some. See some of the other men who've been in the faith for years. They can point you to some. Important, good books. You need to read about the lives of Christian men who've gone before. Amen? How they conducted their lives. To be built up in the faith so that you and your young life could be used radically by God in the earth. God is in need of men and women who sell out all to Him. There's not a lot of those folk on the planet right now. You need to get close to Him and become one of those people. And become a holy terror to Satan and to his flesh and blood minions. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Teaching is of extreme importance to our Christian life. Every part Every aspect of our Christian life is built upon and predicated upon doctrine. How we worship, how we perform outreach, what we see as the purpose of the church and the earth, what the church should be doing in the earth, what I as an individual Christian should be, how I should be governing my life in the earth, is all based upon doctrine. Teaching is of extreme importance to our Christian life because what we are taught will determine what we believe. And what we believe will determine what we are and what we do. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and then he encourages them. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden man to eat, and I will give him a white stone on the stone, a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. The mystics love this verse. You know Why? Because it's so vague and we have no certainty what it's talking about, they can make up all kinds of gobbledygook. And mystics love to make up gobbledygook. And dopes like to hear the gobbledygook and fantasize about what that means and actually embrace some of the dopey gobbledygook. Look, we don't know for sure what he's talking about. We don't know what the manna to eat is for sure. It may be Christ himself. Amen? Didn't he say, I am the bread of life? In reference to the manna that they ate in the Old Testament? We don't know exactly what the white stone is. Historically, we know that many of these cult practices would use pebbles or tickets in order to get into their cultic practices. And they would have a name, a special name written on it in order for them to gain admittance into the cult. So, Christ could be playing off that. 
to let them know, I have a white stone for you. A ticket of admittance into my kingdom. With a name written on it for you. And God does change the names of his people at times, doesn't he? Remember he changed Saul's name to Paul? But we don't know for sure. So please, don't follow some dopey mystic woo, type of Christian who wants to tell you he has the revelation of what the man and the stone and the new name is. Okay? There's more important things to think about than those three things. And when you get to heaven, you can ask the Lord, what exactly were those three things? And then it won't be a mystery any longer. Let's stand up. We'll close in a word of prayer. Father, we give thanks and praise to you that we're able to study your scripture. I thank you that this day we saw the importance of doctrine. And God, all doctrine is built upon your word. Father, I pray that people would come to these meetings we're going to have where we show this DVD of this debate regarding the veracity of your word so that they might be able to defend the veracity of your word to this nation. The atheists and the pagans are doing all they can to attack your word, to bring doubt upon it, to undermine the Christian faith, because it is totally built upon this word. And at the very least, as your saints, this is one area of doctrine we should understand, is how to defend the veracity of Scripture. Praise your holy name. God, I just ask and pray that you would be glorified through what was preached today. That each one here would be caused in their heart and in their soul and in their spirit to be more hungry for you because of what it was preached here today. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. May he do it by his spirit. Amen. You can be seated. And we're going to take communion at this time. Feel free to take communion with us as long as you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, we ask that you not take communion. But if you're a Christian, feel free. You don't have to be a member of this church or something like that to take communion. You just have to be a believer. And we observe the Lord's table every week at Mercy Seat. And the main reason we do that is because we need to be reminded of how we obtain right standing with God. Why? Why do we need to be reminded of how we obtain right standing with God? Because man, in all his religiosity, always wants to think it's Jesus plus something I'd done that gives me right standing with God. Even after we become Christians, before we're a Christian, we'll think, oh, it's, I've done more good things than bad things, so of course I have right standing with God. I'm going to heaven. Once we become a Christian, we think it's, well, yeah, Jesus was important, but it's Jesus plus some things that I've done that give me right standing with God. And that's an absolute lie. His table reminds us what a lie it is. Why? Because there's only two elements at his table. The fruit of the vine, which represents his shed blood, and the bread, which represents his body. And absolutely nothing else. Amen? There's nothing else there at his table but these two elements, signifying the fact that it's through Christ alone that we can meet God. If we try to approach God through faith in Jesus plus something which we've done, God will not meet with us. He will not commune with us. He will not have fellowship with us. We must always only approach Him through Christ alone, whether we've been a Christian for five seconds or 55 years. You cannot try to approach Him through faith in Jesus, plus how many hours you spend in prayer, how many people you witness to, or any other good works you can think of. The good works that we do, they are simply the fruit or the evidence of our saving faith in Christ. The good works that we do, we do not to try and obtain God's acceptance. Rather, we do them because we have obtained God's acceptance. God's salvation is a free gift. All you can do is receive it. Amen? 
Nothing you can do to earn it. Nothing you can do to add to it. It's a gift. And that's how it needs to be received. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time we have at your table. We just ask and pray that you would be glorified here. Be with all our brothers and sisters who aren't here today for whatever reason, O Lord. Build them up in the faith. Be glorified through their lives. Change us all for you, I pray, O God. Draw our hearts closer to you each day. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you. We ask that you would be glorified here as we close in prayer. May each one be moved upon by you this coming week to seek your face. May each man be a priest to his home and open your word to his wife and to his children, instructing them from the Scriptures. May each child listen intently. May their hearts burn within them to want to know more to draw close to you. Build Christian homes, Christian families within the midst of our congregation, O God, by the power of your Spirit. And may we be a light in a dark world. I ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you.